now because I, what I really want to do is just show you some pictures. You know, um, it's a nice intimate gathering and rather than give a formal lecture like I'm in a, uh, a classroom, we'll just flip the script, the, the script. I think I just want to sit down and show some pictures and just talk. And then perhaps if we have time uh, when it's over, we can uh, talk some more beyond the photos. I want to express my gratitude to the Pan-African Union, the Pan-African Student Organization, uh, the Pan-African Center. It's nice to be here. I'm really grateful to uh, Mr. Joshua in particular, who I've been interacting with for the last two or three months or so. Uh, this is what I call African Heritage Month. Some people call it Black History Month. But to me, that's very limiting. You know, this period started in February 1926 uh, due to the direction of a man named Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a Harvard graduate, Harvard PhD uh, graduate um, with a degree in history. And by 1970, the, it had become so popular, and this is during a time of great student activism, that it was expanded to an entire month. It's unfortunate that it's still the coldest, shortest month of the year to tell the greatest story that's barely been told. And unfortunately, at the end of this month, people will put it away and you'll dust it off and bring it out again next year. Um, when I do presentations during this time of year, any time of year, a couple of things. First of all, I don't confine myself to the African-American experience, not that I'm ashamed of it, but that's just a very small period in African history. When I say Africa, I mean black people, irregardless of where they find themselves, whether it be in the Caribbean or the United States or Africa itself. In fact, we're really all related whether we like it or not. There's only one race, and that's the human race, which has its origins in Africa. We know that largely based on studies of DNA. The other thing, as Joshua pointed out, is that I don't really spend a lot of time talking about slavery. A lot of people, that's all they do. And during this month, we talk about the descendants of slaves. We talk about uh, Frederick Douglass, and who else do we talk about? Jackie Robinson. We talk about famous African Americans. But again, that's just a limited part of our history. So what I try to do is really look at Africa and then go from there. So let's start from that perspective. I'm not going to keep you a long time. I'm going to show you some pictures for about an hour and give a brief introduction and then perhaps we can have some discussion afterwards. So let's do a little test, right? And this is your last test for the evening. And I don't want you to really, really pro engage in deep thought. I just want you to give me an initial reaction. When you think of Africa, what are the kinds of things that come to mind? Who wants to go first? When you think of Africa, what do you think about? Anyone? Yeah. Black people. And you said heat. Anybody else? Music. Music, yeah. War. War. Mm hmm. Different kinds of languages. Anyone else? Pardon? Effects of colonialism. Anyone else? Well, this is a fairly sophisticated audience. Yes. Starving children. starving children. Yeah, well, I get that a lot. Not just starving children, but starving people. But usually the answer that I get, and this is a uh, university, so I, I guess we passed the test. Or maybe you're just not being honest. Or maybe a combination of the two. Usually people say wild animals. I mean, I get that almost all the time, because you see on these nature channels herds of wildebeest and zebras crossing a river trying to avoid getting eaten up, eaten up by the crocodiles. And then when I was a kid, which wasn't all that long ago, believe it or not, I would see all these Tarzan movies and King Kong and Bamba the Jungle Boy and Jungle Jim and all of that, and I see lions and tigers. No tigers in Africa, but they were in Hollywood, and they put them in the movies. So wild animals first. Second, um, second response, starving people. And not just starving people, but poverty in general. And then the third answer, pretty consistent, is AIDS, HIV, people you know, dying, people suffering from disease. And if we were to keep going, people might say um, warfare. I think I might have heard that tonight. And let's see, um, sometimes people say slavery or colonization. Tonight we heard the effects of colonization. Now, I travel all over the world. As Joshua pointed out, 
my goal is to visit 100 countries in a 10-year period, and I'm doing pretty well. If I spend more of my life savings and neglect my family some more, I think I'll do it by next year, and then I'll be broke and divorced again, which uh, I'm trying not to do. I'm not married now, but I might as well be. Um, so I go to places like Australia, China, Russia, Japan. I mean, I've really covered a lot of territory. Um, a lot of the South Pacific, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, all over Europe. You know, I pretty much live in Paris, and I've been in at least two-thirds of the countries in Europe. But when I come back from Russia, or when I come back from um, China or Japan, and people ask me about my trip, you know, they don't say things like that. I act, if I would ask people, what do you think of when you think of Australia, or what do you think of China, or what about when you think of uh, Russia, nobody would say starving people. And nobody would say the effects of colonialism, and nobody would say heat, and nobody would say people with disease, none of those things. My point is we have a very biased and for the most part negative image of Africa. And even many Africans, African Americans that is, have that same kind of image. And if you have a negative image of Africa, it seems to me that ultimately you have a negative image of yourself, whether you realize it or not, because Africa is where we come from. Some of us come from there, you know, in, in a quite recent period. And so I dedicated myself quite a long time ago to trying to change the image of Africa in the world and trying to make Africans in particular feel a little better about themselves and trying to make African Americans specifically want to identify with their African heritage. So having given that kind of prologue, we're going to turn on the slide projector and uh, just show some pictures and we'll see where we go, all right? Um, this is an important one. This shows Africa in its most ancient uh, form. These are the remains of an ancient, you might say archaic, African human being called Dinknesh, D-E-N-K-N-E-S-H. That's an Ethiopian word. I don't know exactly which part of, which language in Ethiopia. Europeans call these remains Lucy, after a beetle song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Apparently it was popular with some people at the time these bones were found. They were found in 1974. They represent a species of humanity or archaic humanity called Australopithecus afarensis, or great southern ape from afar. And these bones are about 3.4 million years old. And when they were found in Ethiopia, they really created a sensation. And nothing like it had been found before. We had found uh, what were called Homo erectus and Homo habilis, but these are really ancient. They were found by an African, but they were credit was given to a guy named Donald Johansson, who I guess uh, was able to secure the money for this paleontological excavation, these digs. And since these came out, I think about two or three years, um, five, six years ago, there was another set of bones found in South Africa of uh, the remains of a male figure about 200,000 years older than these. And within the last two or three years, other bones have been found in Central Africa, a country called Chad, dated to be seven to nine million years old. So nobody, when I asked you what you thought of Africa, nobody said the origins of humanity. Nobody said the first people came from Africa. Nobody said the first writing came from Africa, or the first farming came from Africa, or where Africa, Africa is a place where people first domesticated um, fire, where the first tools came from. Africa is where people first built houses, first had farming. As far as we know, first you had metallurgy, all of these things come out of Africa. Africa is where people first stood on two feet, first played music, first buried the dead, first had philosophy and religion, astronomy, morality, spirituality. All of these things first come from Africa. But nobody said anything like that because that's not the image of Africa that we get from television and the mass media. When I was a kid, my image of Africa was of a native I never quite figured out what a native was, but a native always had a big bushy afro, like I used to have, believe it or not. I know that's hard for you to imagine, but I had a big one, I was proud of it. And these natives with these big afros had bones in their noses, and they would have a spear in their hand, not a javelin, but a spear, and they would be running through the jungle, not the rainforest, but the jungle, and they would be, and they would be saying, ooga that was their language, that was all they ever said. And they would be hunting, sorry, for a Christian missionary, 
And if they were lucky enough to find a missionary, they would throw him in a boiling cauldron of water and that would be dinner. That was my image of Africa. And I didn't want to have anything to do with Africa. In fact, when I was young, if you had called me an African, even if you had called me black, those were fighting words. If you called me an African, the best thing for you to have done was to stand back. It was more than likely I was going to swing on you because I knew nothing about Africa. And I was ashamed of my African heritage. I'm afraid to say, or sorry to say, that many African Americans even now are ashamed of their African heritage. And that's really pathetic. Why is this important? Because the past is not dead and history is not finished. As I say over and over again, what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So if you are told that your history begins in a jungle or on a slave ship, that will really condition you psychologically as to how you see yourself and what your capabilities are, what your capacities are. And so history plays a very, very important function. All strong people emphasize their history all the time. Weak people don't. African people, for the most part, begin, even on the continent of Africa, begin their history with the European intrusion. In South Africa, where I've lectured and spent a little time, I've met people who say their ancestors came there 40,000 years ago. And yet in the classrooms, they start in 1652, when the Dutch came. In Ghana, another country I like very much, they begin their history in 1484, when the Portuguese came. It's like Africans didn't do anything before Europeans came and thrust themselves upon them. In Uganda, probably my favorite country in Africa right now, and I think I've been to 25 countries in Africa, they start their history around 1813, when Stanley Livingston and the English came. It's like we don't have a history before Euro the European presence. So let's see if we can change our perception. Now, we are going to spend a good portion of the evening in a part of Africa that not everybody thinks is African, and that is a country that we now call Egypt. Egypt is in Africa. As far as I know, it has always been in Africa. I was there for the 14th time about three weeks ago, and it was in Africa at that time. And I have not read a, a USA Today report or CNN that said Egypt has been moved to another spot. And the people who built Egyptian civilization were Africans too. We know that because people who came from Greece, for example, like Herodotus described the people as having black skin and woolly hair. He was very unequivocal about that. And we know they were African based on the biblical evidence. You know, in the, a biblical uh, genealogy, the biblical table of nations, tells us that Egypt, or what they call Mishram, was the second oldest son of Ham, the black progenitor of humankind. And we know they were African because people have done analyses of the language, and they've done analysis of the blood samples, and the physical anthropology, and on and on and on. There was a big symposium in Cairo in 1974, sponsored by UNESCO, and it was decided, it, the, the point was made that we were going to decide once and for all who the ancient Egyptians were, as if there was some doubt about it. And so they had a big conference, and all of these big-time Egyptologists were invited, and most of them just told the same old stuff that a group of dark-skinned white people came from somewhere, presumably Europe, and they were drawn to Africa like a magnet, and they went to Africa and built the pyramids. They didn't build any pyramids in Europe now, and they didn't build any along the way, but when, apparently when they got to Africa, they were inspired, and they started to build these fantastic monuments. Or some people have even argued that extraterrestrials have come down from the sky, you know, beam me down, Scotty, an episode of Star Trek, and gone to Egypt and build these fantastic monuments. So that was basically what was presented at this conference, except for two African scholars, a man named Theophile Obenga from Congo Brazzaville and a man named Sheikh Ant Job from Senegal. And they just came and presented, a, they showed ancient Egypt in a vastly different light. And they presented all the evidence that I cited and a lot more, which has been published, by the way. This is not obscure information. But they also introduced something new, and that was called the melanin dosage test. And they were able to take or show samples of the epidermis of royal Egyptian mummies in France. I, I don't know if it's the Louvre or uh, the Museum of Man in Paris. And they were able to take samples of the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, and put them, these samples or these fragments in a solution under a microscope. And you could see the melanin, the blackness gleaming right back at you. Basically irrefutable stuff. 
And one or two of the delegates, I think one guy, perhaps even from the Sudan, was so frustrated and exasperated by this, he, they didn't expect this, that he jumped up and down and said, even if you can prove the ancient Egyptians were black, they were still white. And that is the level that a lot of people operate on. So that no matter what you say, they've already closed their minds like you close a window or a book for fear that a new idea might come in. Even now, there's an issue of National uh, Geographic that's circulating that completely ignores the African origin of Egyptian civilization. They concentrate on another part of the Nile Valley called Nubia. But their, the implication is that the Nubians were simply a backwater, that they received the impetus for civilization from the Egyptians themselves, who they assumed to be white. Now let's look at ancient Egypt. This, for example, is a person that everybody really should know, and perhaps you do know his name, I would hope so. His name is Imhotep. And the name Imhotep basically means he who comes in peace. And Imhotep is important to us because he's the world's first scientist. He's the world's first multi-genius. He is far more important, I think, than Leonardo da Vinci, or Galileo, or Michelangelo, or Isaac Newton, or Einstein, or any of the more recent people who we can apply that word genius or multi-genius to. He is the, considered the father of medicine. And I'm talking about a person who lived almost 5,000 years ago. This is not the Imhotep in the mummy movies, the mummy returns and stuff, this is the real Imhotep. And he's a priest, and he's the equivalent of what would be, I guess, a prime minister today. And he is a writer. He wrote a book called The Book of Knowledge. In fact, he was so renowned as a writer that 2,000 years after his death, when he was deified, other Egyptian writers would ask themselves before they would write something, could there ever be another like Imhotep? And he's an astronomer and he's an astrologer. He's many things, but he's also an architect. And this is the building that he designed. And this is called the Step Pyramid. You can see why it would be called that. This is the first pyramid in Egypt. And it's been estimated or has been stated that there are 118 pyramids just in Egypt alone. I don't know how many there are in the Sudan, but this is the first one. And it's also the world's first large stone building and this is about 5,000 years old, and it's from a place called Saqqara. Saqqara is about 20, 25 miles outside of Cairo. So this is the world's first large stone building designed by Imhotep for a man named Zozer in the third dynasty of the third royal family. If you want to understand Egyptian history, it's important to understand the dynasties. A dynasty is a family of rulers, one member of the family coming after the other for an extended period, and there were 30 of them. So this is from the third dynasty, the third royal family. And then you have this one, from these from dynasty four. Now these are the most famous of the pyramids, and these are built in a place called Giza. Now what can we say about them? First, the three big ones, it took about 70 years to construct them. They were constructed around 2600 BC, or roughly 4,600 years before, roughly 4,000 years ago. 2600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, um, they weren't built by slaves, we know that. They were built by free African people, largely farmers. Egypt is made, Egyptian civilization is made possible by the, the, the Nile River. And at that time, the Nile would rise and fall. It doesn't do it so much anymore because you have dams in the southern part of Egypt that regulate the flow of the Nile. But in ancient times, it used to flood, and when it flooded, it was very difficult to do any farming. So what do you do with this excess labor supply? They were put to work on these national construction projects. They're not made of mud, brick, and straw. They're made of granite. And the granite itself is about, came from about 500 miles away. Let's say that you want to build something here, but you go to Chicago to get the building material. And then you had to dig the stone out of the quarry, put it on a barge, sail it down the Nile, to the proximity of the construction site. Another remarkable thing about these monuments is that they were not glued together. The stone was cut so precisely that it was actually fitted together like you would fit the pieces of a puzzle. And even now, it's impossible to slide a piece of paper between these massive blocks. You should go there and see it for yourself. The one farthest from me is called the Great Pyramid. The African name is Khufu on the horizon, Khufu being the Great Pyramid builder. It's 481 feet high. It sits on 13 acres of land. And when these monuments were finished, they were covered with something called limestone, and the limestone was polished and buffed 
until they would gleam like diamonds. I want you to try to imagine the visual impact of a diamond 481 feet high, sitting on 13 acres, and the effect that it would have on the human eye when the sun came out. It is said you could see these monuments, monuments glittering for hundreds of miles. There's enough stone, or at least it's been estimated by some mathematicians in this pyramid complex, that you could take it apart and build a wall that would encircle the entire country of France and would be 10 feet high and two feet thick. The Arabs, who are themselves relatively recent in Africa, certainly in Egypt, they came in numbers about 641 AD, were so impressed by these monuments that they coined an expression, and that is, the world fears time, but time fears the pyramids. Now these are African achievements, and these are things that will seldom be brought up during Black History Month. This is an aerial view of the Great Pyramid of Kufa on the horizon. One of the things I've taken to doing lately when I take my trips is I get in hot air balloons and I fly up above and I'm able to take remarkable photographs. It's kind of scary and you're praying, you get real religious when you're in a hot air balloon and you're praying that nothing's going to happen to you but you can get some remarkable shots. Now the Great Pyramid is composed of, we believe, about 2.3 million blocks of granite stone, the average weight of which is about 5,000 pounds. And I got a couple friends of mine who climbed all the way to the top of this. I tried climbing it and I got about that far and I came down and rode a camel. It's serious business getting to the top and it's even more complicated coming down. And then you have this one right here. This is the second of the big pyramids. And this one is designed by a man named Khafre who was the son of Khufu. In fact, the three big pyramid builders are Ah, you have the first one, the Great Pyramid. That's designed by a man named Khufu. And then the middle one is designed by men, or four men named Khafre. These are the great kings. And then the little one, which looks, doesn't look so little here, but when you re really stand there compared to the other two, it's fairly small. A man named Minkare. You might know them by the Greek names um, Cheops, Kephren, and Mycerinus, but we try to use the African names whenever possible. And apparently the smaller ones were for the great queens of those magnificent kings. Now this one is the second of the big pyramids. You can see a bit of the limestone casing blocks on top, and then down beneath is the monument that we call Hormacket or the Great Sphinx, which is one of the most famous portrait statues in the world. It's about 200 feet long and about 70 feet high. It has the body of a lion and the head of the king. I think the idea was man conquering his lower nature. And this is kind of a, a guardian deity on what we call the Giza Plateau. This is Giza that you see. But probably most of you are used to seeing images like the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. And this is probably what most people think of when they think of Egypt, even me. Now, I've been to Egypt 14 times. I've taken a number of groups to Egypt. I'm taking two more groups this year. But even after I'd gone to Egypt four or five times and ridden read most of the books that my colleague has for sale back there, and I do hope you will come back and see the books and maybe patronize him. Um, still, I had already convinced myself, I mean psychologically, when I closed my eyes and used my imagination, I saw white people building those pyramids because I was so indoctrinated with the belief that Africans never really did anything, even though this is in Africa. So if you don't want to go to Egypt, you can always go to Las Vegas and try your luck. This is an important image. This man's name is Tahotep. I mentioned Imhotep, but this is Tahotep. And this uh, is taken from a tomb very close to the Step Pyramid. Tahotep is considered a very ancient author. And there's a book, I don't know if you all has it, called Tahotep, um, The Teachings of Tahotep, the oldest book in the world. And that book would have been about 4,400 years old. So you're talking about remarkable achievements. And then you have this image right here. Now this one is extremely important because it shows the stature of women in ancient Africa. In ancient Africa, at least we could talk about Egypt, the line of descent is traced to the female side of the family. Women were very, very important in ancient Egypt. In order for the king to be the king, you had to marry the woman in whom the royal bloodline ran. Women could will and inherit fortunes. They could bring suits to the courts of law and you dared not disrespect them. Now here's a woman from the end of the pyramid age who is a great African um, queen. And this boy that she bore 
that came the king of Egypt when he was only 10, and he died on the throne of Egypt at the tender age of 104. He reigned for 94 years. And that tells you that they knew a lot about diet, about medicine, about how to deal with stress, a lot of aspects of medical science. This is an example of that medical science. You can see at the end of the pyramid age, these surgeons performing circumcisions on these teenage boys. And the surgeons must have been pretty good because the, the guys have a big smile on their face. Now, I remember being circumcised. I don't want to get into my personal life, but I remember being circumcised, and I was not smiling, I assure you. I wince in pain every time I think about it. But I just want to say that here we're not talking about a primitive society, a primitive culture. We're talking about a very sophisticated culture that predates the Euphrates, predates the Indus Valley, predates early China, predates Greece and Rome, for sure. And then... These are just images of some of the great kings and queens. This is a king named Nepepid Rob Mentahotep II. He is portrayed in, I guess as he would look, in the afterlife. He is what we would call an ancestor. We know that because of the way the arms are folded, because the beard is curled up as opposed to being straight. He's got what we call the symbols of divinity, the crook and the flail, crook and the flail in his arms. Look at the size of the ears. In fact, this is an even better example about the size of the ears. Now, nobody, as far as I know, has ears like that. Probably not in ancient times, certainly not today. But the idea was the larger the ear, the more you could hear. This is how they modeled the statues. The larger the ear, the more you could hear. And the more you heard, the more you would know. And the more you knew, the more power you would have. In ancient Egypt, they used to use an expression, and that is, ignorance is evil. In modern times, in America, they use the expression ignorance is bliss. Bliss meaning joy, happiness, contentment. That's a re re relatively frightening thing because I'm afraid that we live in a society that where all too often ignorance is glorified where a lot of people simply don't want to know. And that is a scary prospect. And we could point to certain individuals in public life that personify the whole notion that I don't want to know. Even many black students would say, I don't want to hear that black stuff. So that's the dilemma that we confront. Now here, you can see also that not only were the kings African, but that blackness is symbolic. In ancient Egypt, black represented the color of the divinity. And we'll see some examples of that. In fact, the name for Egypt was not Egypt at all. It was Kemet, K-M-T, in ancient times. And that means the black city or the black community. And when the people chose to depict themselves in the hieroglyphic writing, they used a piece of charred wood. So let's move on. This is um, now the image of the black king with the red crown is from around 4,000 years ago. That's from Dynasty 11. The one with the big ears is from Dynasty 12. This one is from the same time period, about 4,000 years ago. And this is um, from a tomb in the center of Egypt, and this shows early examples of martial arts. So long before Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, Africans in the Nile Valley were throwing down. And that hasn't been documented very effectively. Now here is a royal couple, very important couple. This man's name is Amos I, and his wife and, king, and queen, because what good is a king without a queen? Her name is Amos Nefertari. And they are considered great liberators. Again, I want to go again and again to emphasize that women were very important. The couple was the ideal social unit, but women played a very prominent role in society, unlike Greece and unlike Rome. You know, in ancient Greece and Rome, there were probably more slaves than free people. And women were little better than slaves in terms of their status in society. Not so in ancient Egypt. And this woman reigns alongside the king this is a person who reigned independently of a king. Her name is Makare Hatshepsut, and she is considered by some to be the first great woman in history. She reigned about 3,500 years ago for 19 years. She sent an expedition to Somalia. In fact, Somalia in ancient times was considered a very important place. It was, it was called the land of Punt, P-U-N-T, and the Egyptians thought of Punt as God's land. And to commemorate her expedition to Punt uh, is a temple carved out of a mountain in the center of Egypt, a city called Luxor, 
and it used to be in ancient times, you could sail up and down the Nile River and get out and go to this temple and pay homage to this great African woman. This is God Amen, and you can see the way Amen is portrayed. Sometimes it's pronounced Amen or Aman. The name means the invisible one, the unseen one, or the hidden one. And this is one of the great deities of ancient Egypt. Some people believe that it's from the name of Amen, A-M-E-N, that we derive in the Judeo-Christian tradition the expression Amen. I don't know how well documented that is, but certainly it is a popular belief. And you can see how he is portrayed. The Greeks identify this a deity with Zeus, and the Romans identified him with Jupiter. And then we can see this king who takes his name from Amun. His name is Amun Hotep. Hotep means peace. The word Amun means the invisible one, the unseen one, or the hidden one. Sometimes we call him Amun Hotep the Magnificent because he reigned for 38 years. He's very important. And this is his wife and queen, Queen Tai. They are the mother and father, I would argue, of three kings. One named Akhenaten, another one named Sminkare, and another one named Tutankhamun. That's my belief. And you can see some of the daughters down below. Now this is a magnificent statue or set of statues, these colossi, and they dominate the ground floor of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, the largest repository of Egyptian art in the world. They're about 60 feet high, and they look happy and content to be together. You will rarely, if ever, find that in Greco-Roman art. You almost always see women portrayed singularly or men portrayed singularly, almost never together. You know, in this country, they say behind every great man, there's a woman. But I think in ancient Africa, it would be more accurate to say next to every great man was a great woman, and sometimes an even greater woman. And this woman had tremendous stature. Here you can see her portrayed again by herself. This is a small head, about five inches high, of Queen Tai, this is her name, T-I-Y-E, and this is in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. The Germans took a lot of pieces from Africa, as did the Italians, the French, the British, the Dutch, the Danes, you know, you name it, the Belgians. There's an Egyptian collection in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. So a lot of these artifacts have been taken out of Africa, but to me, this is one of the most exquisite I doubt if you will see this on the History Channel or the Learning Channel, and you should not gonna see it on BET. But this is typically what women in ancient Egypt looked like, and this is her baby boy, Tutankhamun, a black teenager, undeniably black, even though that has been obscured for the purpose of commercialism. So much money flows into Egypt from tourism, and most of the tourists are European or white Americans. And so I think that the Egyptian government has a vested interest in not really dealing with the African origins of the ancient Egyptians, the people who built the pyramids. This is a, one of two ebony statues of Tutankhamun, or King Tut, in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and these never accompany or rarely accompany the exhibits when they tour the world. I think the King Tut exhibit is in London now, raking up big money, lots of pounds, but this isn't there. So I think that there are certain political ramifications that have to be looked at. Now, King Tut's significance was not that he did anything that was especially great, but he was, his was the only royal tomb that wasn't ripped off in ancient times. All the other tombs were broken into and vandalized. His was not broken into really until 1922 and officially in 1923. King Tut was a boy king also, like his father. He became king of Egypt when he was nine. He died on the throne at the age of 19. We don't know what killed him, we know it wasn't a drive-by, but beyond that, we're in the dark as to how he met his demise. These are the people who worked under Tutankhamun. Look at those magnificent braids. This is the prime minister of Egypt. Now, I wonder how long they must have sat to have their hair done up like that, but really exquisite. This is an interesting one. This is from a temple at a place called the Temple of Luxor. And this shows an African woman with the star of Sirius over her head. Her name is Sheshat, S-H-E-S-H-E-T, -E -E and she's called the Mistress of the House of Books. In other words, she's identified as the world's first librarian. This is King Taharqa from the 25th royal family, about 700 B.C. He's mentioned in the Old Testament twice. 
three times. He's mentioned twice, I think, in the second book of Kings and the book of Isaiah. He led an army to Jerusalem to save his Jewish allies who were being attacked by the Assyrians. And this is one of the most important ones of them all. This is an early depiction of Jesus the Christ. This is found in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. The Copts were an early branch of Christians. And this is how they portrayed um, their Messiah. And this is called Christ in glory. This is an image of Jesus emerging from his tomb after the crucifixion. This is really shocking to most people because most of us have a one dimensional uh, idea as to how Christ is portrayed. And I was shocked when I saw this, but I was able to uh, bribe an official into taking a photograph of this. I went to the museum, I had a camera, which I wasn't supposed to have, but I had. And I saw this and I was just stunned, as many people are when they see it for the first time. And I was determined to have a photograph of it, so I waited patiently, and I'm not a patient man, so it was excruciating. But I waited until there was nobody around, I thought. And just as I was about to take the picture, a museum official appeared seemingly out of nowhere and said in a loud and angry voice, no photography allowed. Now, I have a pretty bad temper, but I held it in check. I gave the guy a dollar, he said, okay. I gave him another dollar, he said, use a flash. And that's how I came up with this photograph right here. Now, people will say that the color of Christ is not important. And my response is, if it's not important, he shouldn't be painted white all the time. The color of God and how we portray God, for those of us in the Christian world, I think is extremely important. I think it reflects a lot as to how you see yourself. Anyway, this is a very, very important image. And there you have 11 of the disciples, all but um, Judas. Jesus has a nice afro in the middle. And you can even see blood in his hands where he was nailed to the cross. And the guy pointing at Christ's side is St. Thomas, who comes to be known as Doubting Thomas. And that is whether, I'm not saying Jesus was black, you can use whatever judgment you want. That's mostly based on faith. But I am saying that you have a very important early painting that depicts him as such. Now these images quickly take us to other parts of Africa. For example, this one is from Tunisia. Here's an image of Mansa Musa, the Muslim Sultan of the Mali Empire, who went on the Hajj to Mecca and took so much gold with him that the value of gold was decreased for many years after that. He distributed that much gold, that the value of gold was diminished. This is a castle in Ethiopia, a place called Gondar, sometimes called the, um, I think sometimes it's referred to in the tour books as the Camelot of Africa. I don't know if I like that or not. And this is from Nigeria. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, has a population of about 125 million, and it has an ancient history as well. This is one of the Timbuktu manuscripts. The Timbuktu manuscripts have been uh, recently um, brought to light. And these manuscripts, some of them are 800 years old. Some of them go back at least to, so there's one of them, in fact, that refutes Machiavelli's book, The Prince. It was like a rebuttal to Machiavelli's book in terms of might does not make right. They are written, some of them, most of them in Arabic, but some in Songhoi. And then you have the enslavement period. Now, for many of us in the West, that's when we start African history. That's when we start the history of African Americans with enslavement. So let's talk about that for just a minute. This one, for example, is a dungeon where the enslaved Africans were kept. This I actually photographed in a museum. It's called Fort Jesus. It's in Mombasa, Kenya. And this is a, a photograph that I took in Senegal in a place called Gori Island, what local people call Slave Island. And this was an infant's dungeon. They actually had a dungeon for babies. So you had a men's dungeon, you had a women's dungeon, you had an infant's dungeon. And this, these were the cruelties of enslavement. Slaves didn't come from Africa. A lot of people have the idea that all these enslaved Africans were sitting around and these Europeans came and got them and put them on these ships. They weren't slaves, they were human beings. And there were mothers and fathers and husbands and wives and sons and daughters and all of that, and farmers and merchants and teachers and doctors and lawyers, and they were hunted like animals in a forest, chained together, and then marched to these coastal dungeons. The women were systematically raped. Everybody was branded with a hot iron. Imagine what it would have been like to be in a women's dungeon 
and to hear your baby crying in the infant's dungeon and not be able to get to that child. And this went on for so long, it became a way of life. This is another one. This is called Elmina Dungeon. Some people call them castles. I won't do that. I'm sorry, this is Cape Coast Dungeon off the coast of Ghana. And the people were forced to lie in dark holes, chained together in their filth, in their menstrual blood, in their feces, in their urine, people dying to the right and left until there were enough of them to make a voyage profitable. And then they would be taken out of what we call the door of no return and put on the floating coffins called slave ships with names like the good ship Jesus and John the Baptist and integrity and liberty and fraternity and equality and packed like sardines in a can and then taken across the Atlantic in a horrific voyage and they survived all of that. But the history doesn't begin there and they resisted every step of the way. And those Africans loved Africa. Some of them loved Africa so much they put dirt in their mouths and took Africa with them. Tomorrow night I do a lecture, God willing, at uh, Central Connecticut State University in commemoration of the Amistad Uprising. Now I'm gonna just show you quickly now, uh, I've already taken more time than I'd anticipated and we got started a bit late, but these are just images of Africans in Africa and around the world. For example, this represents a school of art in the 19th century called Orientalism. And um, this was a school of art that came out of Europe in the 19th century. And this is from about 1895. And this just shows the natural beauty of Africa. This is called Mose Otunya. A lot of people call it Victoria Falls. Mose Otunya means the smoke that thunders. And this is at the border between Zimbabwe and um, Zambia, the world's largest waterfall, is 41 miles long and the water drops 300 feet. And I think this shows the natural beauty of Africa. And these are Africans. I'm going to finish by just showing, I see you're getting a bit restless. Give me about 15 minutes and we'll be done. These images just show African people in parts of the world that you normally might not associate them. We can call this part of the presentation Unexpected Faces and Unexpected Places, the Global African Presence. These are Phoenician sailors. The Phoenicians were a coastal branch of the Canaanites, very closely allied to the ancient Egyptians. These are African crusaders at the Battle of Jerusalem. This is a mural in the Pantheon in Paris. I think they fought against Salahuddin. They fought alongside Saint Louis, the famous French crusader. And these are, I'm going to show you also images of Africans in many of these parts of the world today. This is a black woman in Yemen, a uh, sheik from Saudi Arabia, a crown prince of Kuwait in the Persian Gulf, where I hope to visit next month, from Palestine, Turkey. I went to Turkey three times between 2004 and 2006 to do research. And I was told at first there were no black people there, but I was persistent and I found a bunch who had been taken to Turkey during the time of the Ottoman Empire. I was able to meet a group of these ladies and I heard their story. They told me that their ancestors were from the Sudan, that they had been captured and enslaved. I said, well, my ancestors were from West Africa. We were captured and enslaved. And it got to be really emotional. And we talked about a lot of different things. They told me they had never seen a black person who either wasn't from Turkey or wasn't from the Sudan. So we had a lot to talk about. And it started to get a little uncomfortable. One of them came up to me and started stroking my arm and said, you look just like my dead husband. And I told her, well, I think I'm about ready to wrap this interview up and thank you very much. But it was delightful. And now I'm hearing that there are about three and a half million people of African descent in Turkey in India, in the rainforests of northern Kerala. I would argue that India has the largest concentration of black people in any single country in the world. And here are some right here. Look at the stature, the physical size of these people. I think that I have interacted with more different kinds of black folk than anybody I know. I heard Hillary Clinton bragging about she had been to 80 or 82 countries, and I've got Hillary beat. And I'm hoping Barack Obama has her beat too. At any rate, these are the black folk in Northern Carolina in the rainforest there. 
And these are tribal people in the eastern part of India, in a state called Orissa, outside of a city called Bhubaneswar. And again, these are people called the Banda, and they live in the mountains of Orissa in the east, not far from Calcutta. This takes us to China. And this is an image during the Shang Dynasty of China of a tiger protecting a black child. This is now in a museum in Paris called the Chernuchi Museum, or Chernuchi Museum. And this is during the Shang period. The Shang are important because they represent the, parent, the uh, formative stage of Chinese civilization. And here we're talking about an image that's approximately 3,000 years old. This is an image of a black man collecting taxes in China in the 15th century. This is an image from Japan of a Buddha with black skin and what I call happy to be nappy hair. Okay? From my perspective, happy to be nappy. This is an image of a samurai deity from Japan called Fudomayo, and he is one of the five wisdom kings in Japanese mythology. There are two Japanese proverbs that have been suggested, that have been uh, referenced in um, suggesting an African presence or a black presence, and that is for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of black blood. Another one says, to make a good samurai, half the blood in one's veins must be black. This takes us to Cambodia, where I've spent considerable time doing research. In fact, this photograph, which I took myself, is on the cover of my most recent book. I have a book that came out in French in December 2005. I'm working on two more, but it's pretty popular in France. And the English title is 100,000 Year History of the African Presence in Asia. And this is from uh, Angkor in Cambodia. Now, the question is, are these people African? And if so, what makes them African? They're clearly Africoid, but are they African? What is in African? And we're going to get a chance to stretch that question a bit further. This is from Vietnam. And when in Vietnam, I was told there were no black people in Vietnam. And yet, I was able to find images like this. And one of the guides I was with said, that's not a black person. That person was just in the sun for too long. These are the people in central Vietnam from the Philippine Islands, from Australia, looks a lot like my daughter, and from Fiji, looks like a combination of Jill Scott and Aretha Franklin. So you have Africans in all of these parts of the world. See, I know a little bit about what's going on in the world today. I'm not so far removed. From Fiji, unmixed black child with naturally light skin. Some black people have naturally light skin, nothing to do with racial intermingling. And here you have the frizzy blonde hair, unmixed. Now, this was a rather interesting story. I took a group to Fiji, I think it was in 2005, 2004. And we were going from one island to another. Fiji is a beautiful place in Melanesia. And uh, somebody said, I got to go to the restroom. We're on a bus. And somebody said, me too. And then somebody says, well, if you're going to go to the, the toilet, because we had to look for a village, somebody says, well, I'm going to stretch my legs. And somebody said, I'll go with you. And then somebody else says, well, if you're going to stretch your legs, I'll go have a cigarette. And somebody says, do you have one for me? And then somebody says, well, if you're going to do all that, I might as well go find a beer. I think I was the one who said that. And somebody said, I'll join you. Everybody got off the bus. And we're all doing our thing. And all these people come out of their houses. And they point to us. And they said, they, people in Fiji love to say, we come from Africa, specifically East Africa. We said, we're from Africa, too. So I mean, we just had a tremendous gathering. And we just went on for a while. And finally, this little boy came with this Snoopy shirt on came out of a house, and everybody stopped what they were doing. People put their cigarettes out, they came out to the toilet, they put their beer cans down, the second beer can in this case, and they gathered around this child. And we were all struck by this little boy. And people started saying, you're so cute, and can I give you some candy? And what's your name? And can I take your picture? Finally, the bus driver just had enough. And he honked the horn, and we all had to get on the bus. And as we were pulling away, the youngest person in the uh, group came up to me and said, Dr. Rashidi, what kind of message did we just send those people there? And he was saying that the message we were sending, that if you're very light, and if you're very blonde, and if you look different than the others who are much darker, then you get all the attention. And I was really struck by that. I never forgot that. 
Now that is not why consciously I was drawn to that child. I was drawn to the child because he looked so different. But in, my, in the back of my mind, I really wonder if that's really what, why I was compelled to, we, why we were all drawn to this child. You know, I mean, it makes me wonder about the fascination with Britney Spears and Paris Hilton and what our standards of beauty are and what appeals to us. You know, we live in a society where I was growing up, they would say, if you're white, you're right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're red, go ahead. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. I find it very interesting that in many parts of Africa, really black-skinned women, dark, beautiful black skin, with beautiful curly hair, are bleaching their skin and straightening their hair so that they look like Tyra Banks and Beyonce Knowles because of the standards of beauty that we seem to have. Now, if that's what you want to look like, it's okay with me. But what does that say? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to look like and why are you trying to look that way? I think that we have had standards of beauty imposed upon us by a culture that is not necessarily sympathetic to African people. Somebody says that the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live, make them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. I travel all the time and I learn a lot. I have more questions than answers. And you know what I learn about most of, mostly? I learn about me and what my values are and how I see the world. And sometimes you find yourself looking in a mirror and what you see, that reflection, is not always very attractive. From Hawaii, this is the first known king of Hawaii, the last regular job I had was as a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And this is King Kamehameha I who united the Hawaiian Islands about 1815. Finally in Europe, an African from ancient Greece, an African Pope, St. Victor, an African emperor, Septimius Severus, born in Libya on April 11, 146 AD. He founded an African dynasty, the Severan dynasty in um, Rome in 193. It lasted until 235. A black Madonna. Now here's a case where blackness may not be ethnic, it may be more symbolic. So that's a question. Sometimes blackness is ethnic and sometimes it is, it is symbolic and sometimes it is both. These are considered miracle workers. This one is in Spain, and you can see the Pope, or one of the Popes, paying homage to this image of African womanhood. Of course, people would say they're not really black, but that's just smoke and dirt from hundreds of years of incense and candles that got on the face, the hands, and the feet. Or sometimes people say they're just black because they're black. Other people have told me in Russia, for example, that they weren't always black, they used to be white, but the people who painted them used bad paint and they turned black over time. These are the Moors. The Moors were black people. The word Moor means scorched, it comes from the Greeks. And the Moors were people who come out of North Africa, who go into Spain and Portugal in particular in the 8th century, the early 8th century, and even parts of France, and they reintroduced elements of civilization in the Iberian Peninsula and dominated it for several hundred years and were not conquered until the time of Ferdinand and Isabella in January 1492. And this is an example of that conquest. A colleague of mine went to Scotland. I went there, but I didn't find this. And he found this in a, a castle. This is from the McClellan clan. And this shows an image of a, a man holding a dagger with the head of a moor impaled on it. And you can see the racial features. This is a man called the Moor of Peter the Great. This is a person who was captured, taken from Africa to Istanbul and from there to Amsterdam, and then transported to St. Petersburg in Russia, where he was given to the Tsar of Russia, Peter I, who adopted him as his godson, and the Queen of Poland was his godmother. And this is the maternal great-grandfather of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, who was considered the father of Russian literature, a man who had African ancestry, he was very proud of it who had a vocabulary of 20,000 words. It's considered by many the father of Russian literature. And then this is an example from Pushkin's study, where you see he was very much uh, concerned about the uh, enslavement of Africans in the, in the Americas. And this is an example of Pushkin. There, there's Pushkin on top, a light-skinned black man. And there's an image of a black man breaking the chains of slavery in Russia in the 1830s. Pushkin was born to well-to-do parents in Moscow in 1799. And then this man's uh, grandmother was a black woman from Haiti, 
this you probably don't recognize him. His name is Alexander Dumas. He's the person who wrote The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Man in the Iron Mask. He's the person who said, one for all and all for one. He said, your work may be finished, but your education is never completed. And he said, a man's mind is elevated to the status of the women with whom he associates. And even in France now, most French people do not know that this great hero or this great writer, nicknamed the mulatto, who called himself a Negro, had African ancestry. Most French don't know that. Now, the Russians know about Pushkin. They don't see him as a black man. They just see him as a Russian with an African ancestor. But Dumas, most French people do not know he was a man of African descent. Finally, the Americas, and this is one of the uh, this is an example of African achievement or African presence in America before Columbus. This is one of the, what are called the Olmec heads, O-L-M-E-C. The Olmec are a very ancient civilization, the parent civilization of the Americas. The civilization probably begins about 1500 B.C. It lasts for about 1500 years. It precedes the Maya, the Inca, the Aztec, the Zapotec, the Toltec. Anyway, this is a massive stone head. There are 18 of these that have been excavated. They all look like black people. But I was told when I was a student at UCLA in Southern California that those were not his original features. Some of these heads weigh up to 80,000 pounds and they were put on platforms. They were used in ceremonies. And this is from Mexico. And the story goes, a UCLA professor told me this in anthropology where I study, that these heads were on a platform and there was a big earthquake. You know, earthquakes can be pretty serious in Los Angeles. And the heads rolled off their platform and they rolled in the mud for a long time. And when they stopped rolling, they looked like black people. And apparently this one rolled around so long, it got braids in the back of his head from rolling in the mud. You see what earthquakes will do. Just save your money. Don't go if you want braids. Wait for a quake and you can save a lot of money. Now this is another Olmec figurine. This is terracotta. And some people say this looks like Lawrence Fishburne. Other people say it looks like Samuel L. Jackson. But to me, it looks like Shaquille O'Neal, the basketball player. Now you can go. You be the judge yourself. Yeah, that's definitely the diesel. I know he's seen better days, but I still like to see him play ball. I started to make a crack about the Minnesota Timberwolves, but that wouldn't go over very well here. Look at this image from ancient Canada. And this is from Ecuador, a country that I spent some time in in October. And then you have this. The Africans are brought across the Atlantic. You know, they are enslaved. We say slaves didn't come from Africa. Africans were captured and enslaved. And they were made examples of. Here's a case of a man who was hanging on a hook because the idea was to instill fear so that they wouldn't resist, they wouldn't run away. But they always resisted. And one of the great resistance leaders is this African-American woman named Harriet Tubman who worked on what we call the Underground Railroad and rescued hundreds of enslaved Africans from the Deep South and brought them into the North, sometimes even to Canada. And these are two black girls from Ecuador. These would be considered Latinos or Hispanics because you have Africans in all of these parts of the world. And finally, the last slide is this image right here of a little girl from a West African country called the Gambia. And the Gambia is a small English-speaking country in West Africa surrounded by Senegal. And Gambia has some significance in terms of African-American history because this is where Alex Haley, who wrote the book called Roots, was able to trace his family tree. Finally found his family, Kunta Kinte's family, in the Gambia, and he went back there. Alex Haley also edited the book, uh, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And I like to end with this slide. I frequently end with this one because this little girl has a real attitude. And she's very serious, as I think we should be sometimes a lot more serious than, they, than we are. And she seems to be looking at every one of us saying, now what are you going to do? Where do you go from here? especially for the African and African-American students, because it's not enough to know this, but what do you do with it? Where do you take it? How do you apply it? What's the significance of it? There's an African leader named Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana who used to say that thought without practice is empty and action without thought is blind. And so I challenge you, where do you go from here? What do you do with this knowledge? How does it change your perception of Africa and African people? So. That's my presentation for tonight. I want to thank you for coming out. Um, I want, again, I want to thank the Pan-African Student Union 
Pan-African organization, the Pan-African Center. Joshua in particular, who has been putting up with me for several months, who's worked very hard to put this together. I know he's not alone, but sometimes perception of being alone is more powerful than reality. And we need young people, you know, to do this kind of work. You know, I'm getting old and I want to feel like my life has had some meaning. And so it's important to me to pass this information down. And this is not just for the black students, this is for all the students. History is for everyone. It's not a black thing or a white thing. And it's kind of sad that again, we can find this to the short month that we call Black History Month. So I raised a lot of points. I don't know if you have questions or not. Perhaps you have questions amongst yourselves. I hope you will talk about these things. Perhaps I said things that were disagreeable to you, things you didn't want to hear. But we can agree to disagree because I don't make apologies for what I presented. I think that African, his, that African people have a history that is second to none, a history that we can be very proud of, and we don't need to be defensive about it. We don't need to be apologetic. We don't have to stutter. We don't have to stammer. All strong people emphasize their history all the time, and weak people don't. So God bless you, and thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Thank you. I don't know if you want to make a comment or two, or where do we go from here? You want a question and answer period? Questions, yeah, question and answer. Anyone have any questions about it? Adam? Is there much going on in Africa? Is there research going on in Europe, or where is it primarily? African Americans, I think, have the luxury and the ability to go to libraries, to do research. Probably everybody has a computer or access to a computer. And so we can do a lot more research. The same thing to some extent applies to black population in Europe. I live in Paris, on the outskirts of Paris, and I meet many African scholars there. And there are many African scholars on the continent of Africa too, but I think that we have the luxury and the resources to do more of this research than people on the, Af on the African continent have. Yes. And then yourself. As a, as a Pan African, how much treatment do you get to a like, seemingly um, artificial national border? I don't know if I fully understand your question. Where you have, um, I studied in the media this last month. Oh, yeah, beautiful country. Yeah. And, uh, strict, so, I know it. Yeah, um, developed, um, Near Angola and yeah. Zambia. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, which to me is suggested artificial uh, nation state border. Um, so, how much, how much credence is, as Pan Africanist would you give to what would appear to be artificial? I think those borders, very good question. I think those borders are part of the problem that Africa has. Now, you know, Africa was colonized, almost the entirety, in the entire continent virtually was colonized, with few exceptions. Ethiopia was not. Um, although Ethiopia was invaded by the Italians in 1935. So you know at the Berlin Conference in the mid-1880s, um, all the major European powers and the United States sat down and decided which parts of Africa they would take. The Belgians, of course, Belgians took the center, center of Africa. The French took a large portion. The English took a lot. The Germans got a piece. Um, the Spanish had portions of it. And so they carved Africa up to suit their own um, interests. And then when, during the, at the end of the decolonization period, borders were redrawn. And I think that it has a lot to do with the conflicts in Africa today. Um, you have different nations of African people. I refuse to, to use the word tribes because I think that diminishes the people. That you have different nations of Africans who have longstanding antagonisms. Perhaps the Luau and the Kukuyu in Kenya could go under that uh, umbrella and I think that these boundaries created a tremendous um, source of conflict. And that little strip of land called the Caprivi Strip is probably a good example of that, where it juts into what normally I guess would be considered Zambia. And to me, it's really crazy. Now, my dream is of a continental African Union. It's like you have the European Union now, where once you get into Europe, you don't need a passport to go to the most part uh, from one country to the other. 
I'd like to see the same thing in Africa, an African Union with a common currency that exists from Cape Town to Cairo and from Somalia to Senegal. Now, whether or when that will happen, we will see. But I think that's Africa's only hope for salvation. Yes. Yeah, a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking about you know discrimination and racism and how it applies to those different people all around the world in those different time periods, or is that a new phenomenon? That's the first question. Well, let me deal with that one first. I think that I can't answer that question simply that there's so many different groups and nations that we looked at that it would really be an injustice to give a blanket answer. But all of the Africans that I've encountered, with few exceptions, have told me that they have been the victims of racial discrimination. And one of the things I find interesting and very disturbing is that wherever I go, for the most part, black people do not control the retail economies in their communities, whether it be in Ecuador, or East Africa, where East Indians control them. They almost have a lock on retail economies. In West Africa, like Senegal, for example, Lebanese, Moroccans, Mauritanians control the economies there. In African-American communities in the United States, there are a few black-owned business establishments. When I was in Namibia, I could not find an, a black-owned hotel. Same thing in Cape Town, in Durban, in Johannesburg. And so black people are at the bottom of the social ladder in virtually every place I've ever been. And in that sense, I think it's, it's universal. But certainly in modern times, if not in ancient times. What's your next question? Uh, you know, Pan-Africanism versus Gormyism, you know, and how the fraction between W.D. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, do you, do you have any information on that? I think Pan-Africanism and Garveyism are the same thing. Garvey dreamed of a uh, universal Negro empire with Africa at the base. You know, Garvey even had a branch of the UNIA in Australia. So Garveyism and to me and Pan-Africanism are one and the same. And I think the differences between Garvey and Du Bois are not as great as a lot of people imply. You know, they were both Pan-Africanists. I see Garvey as a mass leader, whereas uh, Du Bois was an intellectual and a writer. But you know, Du Bois died in Africa. Du Bois got, died in Ghana as a citizen of Ghana, working on the Encyclopedia Africana. Garvey, on the other hand, the arts pan Africanist, never even made it to Africa. Garvey died of a broken heart in London in 1940. But I think ultimately their objectives were the same, and I think they should be viewed as some of the early uh, forerunners of pan Africanism. Now, the first pan African conference that's recognized, as you know, is in 1900 in London, organized by a man from Trinidad, Sylvester Williams, Henry Sylvester Williams. And so it was seen that Pan-Africanism comes out of the Western Hemisphere, and it comes as a response to the, um, the enslavement of Africa's children and the need for us to reconnect with Africa. And I think ultimately Du Bois and Garvey are more similar than they, are, than they were different. Yes. I don't know a lot about Africa. I really am not you know, qualified to really discuss that very much. I do know that you have this movement, um, the African Union, which is, I guess, a modern application of the organization of African unity, which wasn't very effective in the first place. And I don't see the African Union being effective either. One of the things I like about the African Union is that they are making some effort to reach out to Africans in the diaspora. And when they say Africans in the diaspora, I think initially that was meant uh, to apply to Africans who have left Africa relatively recently. But I think now it's being expanded to include African-Americans, African-Caribbean people, Africans in, in South America. So in that sense, it's very positive. But AFRICOM, I don't really know enough about to give an intelligent response to that. Yes. You know, uh, Mm -hmm. And he had a real dynamic uh, slide presentation. And he was in Timbuktu, and he was introduced to 
people that have all been responsible for keeping a sacred and holy book, and they were in the process of translating those books or preserving those books. And since he's no longer here, are you aware of the work that he was doing in Georgia, and are you planning on being a part of that revival or that preservation? Angel was a good friend of mine. John was a great scholar. He is like a brother of mine. We were very close. And uh, I heard the date, I, I heard that Aza was dead within an hour or two from the time he died. So yeah, he showed me pictures of the Timbuktu manuscripts and meeting with the descendants of the great scholar Ahmed Baba. He told me about uh, one particular manuscript that he was very impressed by, which was a rebuttal to Machiavelli's book, The Prince. That's why I use that reference. And there are efforts being made to translate those manuscripts and not just to translate them, but to preserve them. Uh, but how far that has gone recently, I can't say. I do know that Tabo and Becky from South Africa has expressed a lot of interest in that project and that there is a certain amount of funding that has come from South Africa. Now, in December, I went to Niger. I went to Niamey and I was able to see the, temp the Niger manuscripts and I uh, actually picked up some and held them in my hands. And these manuscripts, I think, are even more impressive than the Timbuktu manuscripts. And maybe not as many of them, there are 4,000 of them, but I think they're even more scholarly. They have been selected out of, you know, probably tens of thousands of others. They deal with astronomy, with anthropology, with sociology, with history, with religion, with a wide variety of subjects. And uh, the government of Niger doesn't care anything about them. So the, I talked to the director and the assistant director responsible for them. We just talked a long time. They told me, for example, that you have similar manuscripts in Ghana, in Burkina Faso, all over the area that we call Mauritania, all over the area that we call the Sahel, that the ones in Niger are just crumbling. They're in iron vaults, a metal vault, as a, and they should be in rubber vaults. And they were begging to bring, uh, to try to get attention, the world's attention, to preserve these priceless treasures. I told them I was going to try to bring a group to Niger in December. And they told me that if I brought a group there, they would have a special conference in honor of our visit. And they would put all 4,000 copies of those manuscripts on display for the very first time. If people are interested uh, in hearing about those things and getting information, you can take some of these cards and you can email me and I will update you about the progress of the translation and preservation of those books. Any last questions? Yes. Well, I think the paintings that you are talking about were done by Michelangelo. What, in the 15th, 16th centuries? Whenever Michelangelo is supposed to have lived. And my understanding is he used his uh, uncle and a cousin as a model for those paintings. Now the cops, C-O-P-T-S, are very ancient brands of Christians. Some of the earliest Christians, and I suppose, you know, you could say if anybody knew what Christ looked like, they would be the ones. I think much of that is based on faith and perception. I will say about that painting, which I've dated to be uh, 300 AD. That's the date that I put on it. I don't know how accurate it is, but I'm comfortable with that. That um, the painting has been altered now. I've told you the story about how I was in the museum. I took the photograph, which is a true story. I bribed an official to allow me to take that picture, $2. Now, after I left, the next year I went back and I went back again and again for three years in a row and the museum was closed every year. Finally last year I went back to the museum and they would not let me take a camera in there. There was a metal detector and you could not go in there with a camera or even a cell phone and the painting has been altered. Now the image is, the skin complexion is much lighter, the noses are longer and thinner, the hair is straight and it says 18th century Greek style. So, you know, there's a, a, a guy named Manu Ampem, 
in California who's done a lot of work on, in terms of what he considers forgeries in, um, in Egyptian art and modern falsifications of history. And you could say that that uh, image of Christ has been the, one of the victims of that process to make Egypt basically a non-African, ancient Egypt a non-African civilization. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there a connection, like an um, artistic trend? Are they all related? No, I didn't see that in Johannesburg. In Johannesburg, um, you know, I did a few lectures, did some radio interviews, went to some bookstores, but I didn't, I didn't even hear about that church. Um, the Black Madonnas are very ancient. And those statues, some of them um, are a thousand years older or more, a thousand years older or more. Uh, you find them all over Europe. There's about 500 of them just in Europe. Now, obviously, there are some in Africa, too, many of whom are much more recent. But the ones in Europe are very striking because there's such a small population of black people in Europe, at least it has been until recently. And so to see these, in many cases, jet black images of Mary, mother of Jesus, and the Christ child is very striking to me. You find them in virtually every country, certainly in um, Switzerland. You have the famous one in Poland, identified with the Solidarity Movement, which is officially the Queen of Poland. You have a lot of them in Italy. You have a lot in Spain. And you have about 200 of them that have been documented just in France alone. There's an excellent book called The Cult of the Black Virgin, The Cult of the Black Virgin, by a man named Ian Begg, E-A-N-B-E-G-G. -G. He's from Switzerland and he spends a lot of time with them. So I think that the ones in Africa are very different than the ones in Europe and have a much greater significance. The ones in Europe are considered, and not just Europe, but you also have some in, um, I've seen some in Costa Rica. Uh, I just saw one in Ecuador not long ago. I think that um, they are more significant and they're considered to be miracle workers. And the miracle working power is supposedly tied to their blackness. So I would like to see somebody do a lot more study on those Madonnas. I've seen one in France, in Paris, called the um, Black Virgin of Paris. And then I saw three more in a place in, outside of Paris called Chart. I've seen some in uh, the Kremlin in Moscow. I've seen a couple of them in Spain. And it seems to me that I just saw another one somewhere else in Europe. So they're fascinating. And you also have these images of black saints like St. Maurice, for example, a patron saint of the Holy Roman Germanic Empire, black as a crow in various parts of uh, eastern uh, Germany, in Lithuania, in Latvia, and that part of the world. Now, there's one in particular that I want to see, which is in a place called Magdeburg, about an hour's drive, I think, east of Berlin by train. But I've been advised, if I go there, be very, very careful, because there's so many skinheads.